Hey folks, uh, today I'm going to talk about disturbing films. I want to recommend some movies that I find disturbing. Uh, but I feel like these lists, like, it's always the same movies, right? It's Cannibal Holocaust, it's uh, The Human Centipede, it's uh, all these gross-out movies like August Underground and all that stuff. That's not really disturbing to me. I mean, I don't really, you know, enjoy an experience like a Serbian film, right? But, like, I want to get towards the more, like, psychological stuff, and there's some gory stuff as well on this list, um, but, yeah, I, I basically wanted to, wanted to highlight some films that, that I find disturbing, but I, I never, like, see on these, uh, disturbing movie lists, so, let's just get into it. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that Punishment Park is one of the bleakest movies ever made. I discovered this one randomly on Mubi, and I thought it had a really interesting concept. It's from 1971, and it's a mockumentary from a British filmmaker sort of critiquing America, like the Vietnam War and, and blind American patriotism. Uh, the film also has a lot to say about law enforcement and the U.S. prison system. So, this sounds like a cliche, but, you know, the themes are just as relevant now as they were back then. In this alternative reality, the prisons of America are overrun. Because of this, a new type of corporal punishment is signed into law by President Nixon. All new prisoners now get a choice. They could either go to an overcrowded prison for essentially the rest of their lives, or they could go to Punishment Park, where they could have a chance to win back their freedom. Punishment Park is a huge desert, where you have to survive on your own while you are being hunted for sport by law enforcement. If you make it to a specific point in the park, however, you, you get to claim your freedom. What I think makes this movie really disturbing to me is how far the filmmakers go to make this feel like an actual documentary. Uh, you get a really good idea of how the park is set up, how people are picked, and the struggles they have to go through once they are actually in the park. Uh, it also follows some of the officers that are hunting people you know, for fun, essentially. Uh, you are shown testimonies from anti-war activists being sent to the park because they did not want to participate in the Vietnam War. I, I don't know, maybe it's because we're so divided in politics right now and the current state of the world, but this film was super uncomfortable for me to watch. Nevertheless, I think it's one of the best random film discoveries I've ever made. The War Game is a BBC production, and it's directed by the same filmmaker as Punishment Park, uh, Peter Watkins. This is another documentary, but it's made a little bit earlier than uh, Punishment Park. Uh, this one is uh, about, um, essentially, like what would happen if the UK would be hit by an atomic bomb. Uh, if, if that premise sounds familiar to you, it's because uh, the, the BBC film Threads uh, it's actually an uh, uh, unofficial remake of, of this one, the war game. Uh, so, you know, it's pretty pretty interesting that the BBC has made, made two mockumentaries about <laughs> the UK being uh, nuked. And there's actually a lot of really interesting things to, to read about these productions, uh, but I don't really have to get into it here. Uh, both films are very good, and, and you can find The War Game. Uh, I saw it on archive.org. It's apparently also on Vimeo. I'll, I'll leave some links in the description. But uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty bleak stuff. I could understand someone calling She Dies Tomorrow more bleak than disturbing. However, as someone with anxiety, the premise of this film is just my worst nightmare. The movie is about an illness of sorts. It's about uh, people waking up and just knowing deep in their gut that tomorrow is going to be their last day alive. And it's kind of like It Follows, where the sickness spreads from person to person. But in this one, multiple people can have the illness at the same time. Uh, so it's not... This one is not, you know, disturbing when it comes to, like, gore or anything like that. This is more existential terror. Uh, so if this stuff doesn't really bother you, you'll probably just think it's a pretty cool artsy movie. But for me, uh, like, this is the type of shit that really terrifies me. I found it deeply disturbing. Men Can't Be Raped is a Swedish and Finnish co-production from the late 70s. It's based on a book by the same name that came out a couple of years before the movie. This might be incredibly hard to find with English subtitles, but I wanted to talk about it anyway.
This is a revenge story, like I Spit on Your Grave or The Last House on the Left. But it removes the exploitation of those stories and replaces it with a sense of realism and social commentary. Needless to say, this is a very heavy movie, and the thing I found most disturbing of it was its betrayal of the consequences of sexual assault. You feel for the main character as her entire life falls apart, and, and she watches the man who, who wronged her continue to live his life like nothing ever happened. But do not be fooled, this is a very heavy drama, so don't go in expecting to see like a gory, crazy revenge movie. It's rather slow-paced, and I think some people will be put off by that, but the ending is totally worth it. Without saying too much, I think this is my favorite ending to a revenge film ever. Um, I watched this on a Swedish streaming service, but I do believe there is a DVD out there of this film. Uh, you can, of course, also check out the original book if the story sounds interesting to you. Michael Haneke is a name that comes up a lot when talking about disturbing films. Uh, movies like The Piano Teacher and Funny Games are straight-up classics when it comes to this type of stuff. But I haven't really heard a lot of people talking about Benny's video. Uh, this was made before Funny Games, so we're talking like early to mid-90s. Uh, but this is one of those movies, uh, you know, like a previous one I mentioned, where it's still relevant to today's society. Benny's video is essentially about a boy who lives his life through his video camera. He is always filming or tinkering with the footage that he's got. Uh, as the film progresses, he becomes more and more detached from reality, which ultimately has devastating consequences. Michael Haneke would later revisit some of these themes in uh, his most famous movie, Funny Games. Obviously, this movie was made way before social media, but it's hard not to see the parallels between Benny wanting to go out and shoot some crazy footage and today's smartphone obsession and, and social media. The movie has some very tough scenes to watch, but I think the thing that elevates this movie for me is the acting. Some of the interactions Benny has with his parents, are, they're simply heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, you watch his parents try to struggle with the the consequences of Benny's actions. Berlin Syndrome is one of those films that has a concept you've seen been done a thousand times before, uh, but the execution is really what elevates it to be a, a cut above the rest. I haven't really heard anyone talk about this film, but when I was doing research, I saw that this director went on to do the Black Widow standalone movie for Marvel. So maybe this one is not as much of a hidden gem as I thought. Nah, nevertheless, I wanted to include it in the video. In the film, we follow an Australian woman on vacation in Berlin. Uh, she has a holiday romance with a local high school teacher. Everything is going great until she spends the night with him at his place. Uh, she wakes up and realizes that uh, she's locked in. And from that point on, the man, like, he does not let her leave her apartment. Uh, as I said, this is not necessarily an original concept, but what makes this movie so disturbing is how genuinely hopeless it feels. Without saying too much, I think the film does a good job of not falling into cliches that you would usually see in a movie like this. Uh, this is not interested in, like, sheep frills, and instead it takes a more realistic approach. Uh, like, I think if you've been in an abusive relationship, this film might actually be triggering to you. Uh, so just know that going in. The Woodsman is directed by Nicole Castle and stars Kevin Bacon as Walter, a convicted pedophile who returns to his hometown after spending 12 years in prison. Having your main character be a convicted child molester is such a bold choice. I have no idea how this movie even got financed and made. Uh, nevertheless, I'm glad it did because it gave me an experience I, I don't think I'll ever forget. See, I, I think a lot of people misunderstand this movie and other similar projects. Uh, the movie never tells you to forgive Walter. It is simply showing the story of someone who has done unforgivable acts being reintroduced to society. And look, I, I think it's pretty obvious what is disturbing about this one. This one is filled with very heavy themes. The one thing I wanted to mention, though, is that I, I think this film is great, but there is one scene in particular that gets, like, 
a little bit silly from a writing perspective. And, and, and that's all I'll say about that I, because it's rather late in the film. But I still love this movie and I, and I think it's a good watch if you want to challenge yourself. I Start Counting deals with a lot of dark and taboo subject matters. It's a British coming-of-age mystery film from 1969. This is one of those movies that it can't be made today, at least not with this scope and budget. Like, it feels like at least one producer would take a look at the script and say, yeah, we're, we're not doing this. Uh, I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. It's just fascinating to me. Uh, I guess what I'm saying here is that the movie very much feels like a specific point in time in history. So as I said, the film is both a coming-of-age story and a mystery, namely a serial killer mystery. Our, our main character is a young girl. Uh, she can't be more than like 14 or 15. Uh, she has a foster brother that she is madly in love with, even though he is in his mid-20s. Uh, she fantasizes about him, and she wants to be with him in a way that feels, you know, uh, a bit less innocent than just a silly crush. Uh, she starts suspecting, however, that, that her brother, her foster brother that she has a crush on, is hiding a dark secret. And uh, she begins kind of an obsessive journey down a very dark rabbit hole. What I will say is that the movie subverts your expectations, and it doesn't really go where you think it will. The one disclaimer I will give is that this is a pretty slow movie, and I think this is one that I like discussing and reading about more than actually watching the movie. Uh, nevertheless, it's a very uncomfortable watch for many reasons, and the ending makes the whole experience worth it. Uh, but just in terms of its pacing, it might not have aged the best. Rabbit Dogs is like the definition of a hidden gem. Because of financial reasons, this movie was shelved after its making in the 1970s, and it wasn't released until decades later. Uh, this is Mario Bava's last film, and it's a huge departure from the rest of his filmography. Uh, this is a grim thriller where a group of bank robbers hold a family hostage uh, to escape the police. Uh, see, this is a road movie, and the bank robbers want the family to, to drive them over away from Rome, where they, they, they rob the bank. I'm not going to tell you what makes this movie so disturbing, because that would ruin it. Uh, those who know, they'll know. Uh, I will never forget this ending. Uh, apart from the ending, the movie is also filled with like psychological torture of this family, and and overall, it's just a very unpleasant watch. Uh, in the same way that a lot of like grindhouse and exploitation movies are. Uh, Mario Bava was a filmmaker that pushed limits, and, and often, like, just to see how far he could go, uh, over the course of his career, his, his, his movies only got more and more violent and extreme, and as I said, this is, like, his last, or if one of his last movies, certainly the last one released. Return to Epipo is a Hungarian documentary that's available to watch on HBO Max. This movie is essentially about confronting childhood trauma and re-examining experiences you had when you were young with the eyes of an adult. I think this movie is really fascinating. It, it, it sheds a light on what happened at a yearly summer camp in Hungary for kids in the 1980s. The camp was called Epipo, and before it was known for its systemic abuse of children, a lot of people had incredibly fond memories of their time at this camp. We are shown how a lot of people became friends at the camp and then stayed in touch for the rest of their lives. Uh, some people in the documentary say that they look forward to Epipo all year and it shaped them as individuals. All of this would be ripped away from people when years later uh, people start speaking out about the verbal, physical, and sexual abuse they had to suffer at this camp. In that way, you can label it as a true crime documentary, but it doesn't really linger on that stuff. It's way more interested in hearing former campgoers now reevaluating essentially their entire childhoods. Uh, the filmmakers did a lot of one on one interviews, and they also filmed uh, some reunions with former campgoers. You are essentially watching people process their grief and sadness throughout these conversations. There is a lot of sadness on anger on display here, and that's what makes the film. It's, it's not easy to watch at all. Uh, this is by far the most emotionally draining film on this list.